All right, am I on? Um, I do apologize. This is going to be much more boring um, than the last couple of talks, but they didn't tell you there, there is actually a bed backstage if, if it gets that bad. Um, I'm in that bed right now. <laughs> smart. OK, well, um, Irene already introduced me, but uh, I'm Andy. I live across the river in Cambridge, um, really into the local mapping scene. I have this. Bostonography blog that she mentioned. That's kind of just for fun, but um, it's uh, Tim Wallace who works for the New York Times and me. We, we, we enjoy making a lot of maps of the Boston area and just kind of exploring geography that way. Um, also, I just want to plug, um, I help organize this Map Time Boston. If anybody's interested in learning mapping technology, who was that? <laughs> um, uh, see if there's a Map Time chapter in your city, or if you're in this city, please join us. It's really good. Um, but that stuff's all on the side. Most of, mostly what I do is I work with uh, Axis Maps or a small company. We do um, interactive web maps, basically a lot of custom designed um, things for a lot of purposes. This is just a little um, example of some stuff that we do. Um, and really what I want to talk about today is like this napkin sketch is kind of, I don't know if you can read it, but sort of a version of of a mock-up of um, a lot of our projects where <laughs> we're not really designing just a map. We're designing the, and building this thing where like a client is going to throw uh, who knows how many different data sets at it and our, our map is going to have to support all of that. And there's a lot of challenges um, around that, which is what I'm going to get into today. Um, when we went to cartography school, we, we really learned this, this mapping craft as an attention to detail um, and really finding the particular story that lies in the data that you have and, and crafting your map and your story around that and really perfecting it based on that. And in the, I think the reality of a lot of modern web cartography is you can't really do that. You have to make this map out of something that you know, you kind of know about the data, but you can't see the data and you don't necessarily know exactly what the perfect story is in there. And you're, you're building something that um, can work OK. And this comes up a lot, at least for us, because you know, sometimes it's that thing where there's a whole bunch of data sets, and it's kind of an exploration tool. Sometimes we have to do this work simply because the data isn't ready yet that the, that the client wants us to use, but we still need to go ahead and, and start working on our thing. Um, or maybe because it's going to change in the future, they might add something, remove something. And of course, we don't want clients coming back to us a year later complaining because the map looks like garbage because they threw this new data set at it. So um, really what, what I'm searching for here is um, various compromises in, in a number of areas of where, where we find these challenges in our experience and maybe some others' experience um, of trying to balance that really good design with kind of not knowing how to do good design because we don't know what we're designing. Um, and I have here what follows is kind of, it's a little bit of a laundry list, um, a little bit me thinking out loud about what are, just trying to go through some areas where we find some challenges and think about what the problems are and try to identify certain solutions, um, which are never perfect. Again, this is about compromises. Um, and try to find you know some things that other folks have have done in these areas, um, but also a lot of this I'm just trying to learn myself. So I'm very interested in other people's experiences and um, and so forth. And I should caution: I don't have tons of answers. A lot of this stuff is just questions and saying, "Well, this is hard. I don't know what to do." And so, uh, if anybody does have answers for some of this stuff, that would be awesome. So uh, I hopefully this isn't like too disjointed in my in my uh, ordering of all this stuff. But I'll go ahead and start with uh, my first category here. And I think this one comes up a lot for us, just data classification. And I mean, in particular, for choropleth maps. And how do we you know, divide bin, bin our data into different classes? And those are going to be the different colors on the map. I don't know if you can see this very well, but well, I guess I could try the zoom thing. Um, so this is sort of what I'm talking about, different ways to you know, arrange your, your data classes on a map. And this is a graphic from um, 
John Nelson, who wrote this really helpful article explaining some different classification methods and how they affect the map in the end. And um, if you're not familiar with John Nelson's work, just ignore me for the next 40 minutes and go to his website because it's really cool. Um, there's a post here. Uh, oh, and by the way, I, I should mention there was a link to this, these slides in the first page. I also just tweeted it. Hopefully it went out. Um, if you want to actually follow some of these links here and, and see that article. But this is just a really simple example of what a difference this classification scheme can make. This, you know, these three maps have the same exact data, but they're just chopped up in different ways, and you get these vastly different maps. And if we are designing some system of interactive maps that has to accept a whole bunch of different data, we don't want something that looks like this one popping up very often because it's not a useful map. Um, so we want some kind of compromise that's going to work reasonably OK for almost anything. So this frustrates us a lot. Maybe we're doing it wrong, but we do these designs in my company a lot where we kind of design around this idea of this really nice, almost normal-ish data distribution, makes a nice histogram and all this stuff. But nope, it's like never like that. <laughs> or there's always one or two with you know, some stupid outlier down here that just ruins everything pretty much every time. There's always going to be one. So yeah, rule number one, just that will happen always. Um, so what I'm, yeah, well, this is what I, I'm getting at. We need to have some kind of classification um, rules that are going to work pretty well for almost anything without us actually having to look at the data and figure it out for that data set. And there's a couple of common ways that cartographers do this, which I'll get to in a second. But these are some important questions to consider on how you bin your data. Um, this really goes for any map, but it's not just for this, this particular purpose. But we're trying to make a compromise that's going to be a pretty good answer for all of these. So first and foremost, is the map going to work? Is it going to look good? Will it be useful? You know, like that map a minute ago that was all one color, basically, that's not a map that's useful. And it also doesn't look good. Um, same, I just wanted to throw charts in here, too, because if, uh, interactive mapping often involves also other visualization elements, like charts that are accompanying it. So same question for those. Are the breaks meaningful, these class breaks, the, you know, the numbers between the, where the bins lie? Um, by meaningful, I mean, does it actually have some sort of real world meaning, this number that we're using? A good example, I think that came up a lot in uh, like cartography classes in colleges. If you're mapping income, for instance, you might want to have a break that's at the poverty line or at certain other meaningful um, area, um, levels. Or if you have a diverging set, maybe the number zero is a good place to have a break. And are they understandable? Meaning, by this I mean, um, th does the reader, the map user get like how these numbers were derived and why they are, why they are where they are. Um, so a couple slides back, one of John Nelson's uh, examples was the standard deviation, for example, um, classification where you're making breaks at like the mean and then one standard deviation out and so on. Um, but depending on your audience, I can imagine that um, people may not understand what that is and why, why you chose, chose these numbers and what is a standard deviation and what does it mean. Um, and then this sounds trivial, but are, the, are they nice numbers? Like you don't want, you want 400, you don't want 402.3785 or whatever, unless that's a meaningful number. So these are some things I think that we're often trying to compromise to do okay at. And a, a couple of just, I just, I'm gonna name two like common methods, which should be familiar to anybody who does mapping, but these optimal breaks, uh, breaks developed by George Jenks in the 70s, I guess. Um, it tries to find these kind of natural breaks in the data by this algorithm that maximizes similarity within groups and uh, difference between groups. Um, if you're a JavaScript person, check out Atomic Wright's uh, statistics library. It has an implementation of this you could look at. But of course, it has downsides. Like, this is going to give you some of those weird numbers. Um, and they're going to be crazy different for every distribution, and it may be difficult to compare. Um, or to kind of maintain consistency. Um, this is the f kind of a fake classification, but it might look something like this on this histogram. 
you know, you, for one thing, this outlier is definitely going to be all by itself because that is clearly like a natural break in there. And then you would have some other sort of reasonable breaks in the middle. Uh, quantiles then is another kind of easy go-to where you just simply divide your, your data into equal sized bins. Uh, on the map, and I guess I don't have a good picture of this, but again, there was one a few slides ago. Um, it kind of guarantees that your map is going to have some variety. You're never going to get that one color map. Um, you're going to see an equal number of, of uh, entities in each color. So it can give you a pattern which is not necessarily truthful, but it's there. Um, just a code example, D3 has quantile scales. And by the way, I, I have like miniature code things thrown about here. It's mostly just JavaScript, uh, often D3. That's what we use a lot. Um, but this isn't a very technical uh, talk altogether. But there's big downsides to this. Like um, you get these groups that just don't really make sense because you might have numbers really far apart from each other thrown into the same group. You might have two numbers right next to each other split into different groups. Um, so that's a big downside to these. So here's an example. If you just did uh, what, quartiles on this distribution, it you know, looks somewhat reasonable in here, but then you get this thing where this doesn't really belong with, all, with like that. Um, so not perfect, but something we've done a few times is um, use percentiles, but not even, even buckets like this. Uh, actually kind of try to pull off a high end, maybe a low end into its own class to fix that problem a little bit, not really. Um, I don't know if you can see my extra color here, but you know now this guy is still joined with these, but it's only joined with a couple of them. It's not quite as bad. Um, and oh, I, I guess I should mention, yeah, one of the problems with percentiles or quantiles is you are no longer, you're not really looking at the actual numbers anymore necessarily, and even my little scale here this is not giving you actual numerical values. It's just saying 50th percentile, and you don't know what that is. Um, what we often do in a case like this is we'll label our graph, maybe our legend, this way with just 25th, 50th, something like that, but then uh, relegate the actual number to an interaction. Maybe you hover over this, to, over this thing, and you can see um, this, of course, is not interactive, but imagine it. If you hovered over this thing, you would see some actual value of where you are in that histogram or on the map, of course. Well, this is just a screenshot of something we did do like that. It's a map of some health data in um, public health data in Illinois. And it's very much like that. There's this one outlier way out here, which is Cook County, Chicago. Um, and uh, as Ken Field is in the audience, I want to assure him that this is not because there's a lot of people in Chicago. This is actually a normalized map. Um, so it's not a bad choropleth, just whatever. I don't remember what the variable is, but it's, it's, it's something per capita, I think. <laughs> Anyhow, so anyway, that's just an example. And one final thing that um, I've done a few times is kind of getting away from that understandable criterion, but rather than dividing up the actual data itself to do percentiles uh, based on the unique values, so transform that the problem that we often encounter if we don't do that is you'll get these data sets where like half of them are just the value zero or something. And technically, if you did like quartiles on that, then your zeros would span like two or three of the classes. Well, I guess if it's half, it would be two classes of that data. And you get this really weird map where like you have zero labeled on two different colors and probably the code is just going to end up coloring them all the same. It's really confusing. So um, this is something I've done sometimes is pull out the unique values and base the classification scheme only on the unique values and not on all the values. Um, and simple little code, code example there in JavaScript. Um, there's probably easier ways to do it. OK. That's my last bit on uh, data classification. Um, the next bit I wanted to get into is simply how things get really messy when you don't know what's coming, you end up with stuff on top of other stuff, and it's illegible. So this is probably pretty obvious, but things are always going to overlap. And a, really thing, a thing not to forget is just to, if you have, say, circle symbols, make sure the small ones are on top of the big ones. Otherwise, you can't 
get at the small ones or you can't see them. Um, simple little example here. Um, bunch of circles all on top of each other, but they're ordered right, so you should be able to like, get your mouse on every single one of these. Uh, also, overlap, just a quick thing, goes for not just the map, but also like labels and things like that. Uh, histogram here where, by default, it would just label everything directly under where it is, but we wrote some code to make sure that things get spaced out and never end up on top of each other. Um, then there's this, um, there's this issue of scale. And a good example of this is a county map um, where some counties are huge and you can easily get at them and some are gonna be really tiny and you can't unless you zoom. Um, or maybe you don't even know what your geography, all of your geographies are and um, you don't know if they're gonna be big or small or what. Um, this, this here is a kind of a fake mock-up using a New York Times election map, um, but it, it's trying to show a, a, a thing that we have done from time to time, and New York Times sometimes also does some similar map navigation, but it's your basic kind of slippy map. You have these pan and zoom uh, capabilities. You've got those zoom buttons. You can freely move around the map. You can zoom into wherever you want. But also we add this kind of extra, more design guidance of the map user by not forcing them, or not relying totally on them clicking zoom button every, every time. But when you're zoomed, so in this example, you're zoom, when you're out at looking at the whole nation, um, we have you, if you click on a state, it zooms right into the state rather than um, interacting with that county level. And then once you're zoomed in a little bit, then you can interact with the counties. You can still pan and zoom or what. Um, and it's, we've done this a couple times just to, in an attempt to give the, yeah, give the user a little more guidance and try to design what we're doing. So we don't know everything that's gonna be underneath there, but we do know that we have, say, states or maybe it's countries or something. And you can kind of take advantage of that and use what you do, what you do know to try to um, guide people into the more unknown scale. Um, this is to say nothing of actually varying extents, like if you don't know if your data is going to be in the US or Asia or what, I, that's another issue I suppose too, which I apparently don't have anything to say about, so <laughs> I don't know why I mentioned it. <laughs> um, okay, then there's uh, this next bit, null, uh, is to, just to remind the cartographer that there's probably always going to be holes in the data, missing data, maybe bad data, and, and you just don't know, and you always need to be aware of that. Um, always catch that, those, those null values and explicitly design for them, because they are, in a sense, they are data as well. And uh, those of you here last year, Andy Kirk gave this, this nice talk about the design of nothing, and uh, one of the sections that, of his talk was, was really about that. It was about how do you, about designing for the lack of data and actually what a, what a powerful element that can be. There's, there's certain uh, visualizations where, that he showed where these gaps are really meaningful and they're, they're kind of telling a story. And he showed, um, well, there's a bunch of examples there. You can check out, check out the video of his talk last year because it's pretty good. So the first thing we always have to remember is that this no data can come in a variety of ways. And um, we at least need to know what we might be looking for. And hopefully we do. But when it comes into, when it gets piped into the JavaScript, however it gets in there, you know, it might come up as null or undefined or not a number or a blank string or an actual, like literally the word null um, or some, you know, stupid number that they put in to stand for no data. Um, so yeah, the important thing is to just, I guess I don't really have a great example of this, but um, there's a lot of functions we write where of course the first line of this, if this uh, function is like, if this thing's null or whatever, then do something else. Um, because if you don't catch that stuff, um, the map can get confusing. Maybe things might just disappear or you're gonna get some default thing like an SVG solid black fill, which looks terrible. Um, Things like that. So you, we really want to be explicit about it and 
and not let the map get confusing because we, want, we don't want the map reader to confuse no data with data. Um, just a, a little thing that I always forget to do is remember that zero is different from um, like null. And there's some, a code thing you can kind of get tripped up on if you just say if this doesn't exist, it's also going to think that zero doesn't exist. But usually zero is actually data that we want to catch. Um, so a couple of examples of how you can design for null data. And again, you should just go back to Andy Kirk's talk from last year, because there's a lot of this. But um, texture is something we've been getting into lately. This is a modified example of this uh, textures JS map, which is really cool. I think it's for D3. And it makes it really easy to make these SVG textures. And that is a lot better than trying to figure out how to write a path command for a stupid diagonal line. And like, it's been figured out for you. Uh, you can make nice, maybe, uh, hatch stripe patterns to indicate your no data. It's very clearly distinct from colors. Um, you know, we also just color things gray a lot if it's no data. But depending on the color scheme of the map or everything else, that could get lost, could get confusing. Um, so check out this textures thing if you're a D3 person. It's pretty, pretty great. Uh, these lines are just one example. There's all kinds of patterns that are built right into it. Um, just another specific example is uh, time series data and being explicit about when there's gaps in there and not trying to interpolate and suggest that there's actually data in between two points. So this is, uh, you may recognize this from the iOS 8 health app that somehow figures out how many stairs you walk up, I guess. Um, but yeah, so there's all these days here where I guess I didn't walk up any stairs. <laughs> and I, I do live on the second floor, so Apparently, I didn't leave the house. <laughs> but uh, I like how it, it makes this dashed line, this shading underneath it, to make it really clear that this is not like a real trend. There's just nothing in between, but um, while still kind of maintaining that, that consistent line. I guess I updated this yesterday because the previous graphic I had in there was like average of one, and there's like a bunch of days missing. Lazy month, I guess. Um, this is this is a screenshot from an old old map we did some years ago. Uh, it's probably a little hard to see, but we had a I guess this was an animated map of proportional symbols showing Jewish population in various U.S. cities over some time period, and it would do what you expected. You know, the symbols would grow as the population got bigger, but we had all these years where there was missing data for certain cities. Where so there's uh, St. Louis here. We had data for 1850, but we didn't have data for 1890. And then maybe we had data for 1910 or something. And we attempted to do something here. I don't know how well this really works, but we didn't want the symbol to just go away. We also didn't want it to remain to say 600, because we know it's not 600 still in 1890. We just don't know what it is. So what we tried to do is re retain the last known symbol but give it this like empty, they're also pretty small, but empty circle character and hope that that was clear. I, I don't even remember where to find this map anymore. There was probably like a legend with it that maybe indicated that. Um, but this is an interesting thing. I actually, I would like to hear other thoughts on how to kind of design for gaps in animated maps where you are missing data. OK, next thing. A little bit about text. And I don't have a lot here, but I wanted to bring it up because I'm talking about maps. But it's easy to forget that a big part of maps is actually the, the text that goes with it, whether it's on top of the map or beside the map or whatever. That's, it's almost always there. Um, uh, Marty Elmer wrote this nice post a year or two ago about uh, pros in cartography and a lot of good examples. That's what this link is up here. Don't read the rest of it. But um, I only want to mention one thing. This often happens to us is that we have this nice design and we're kind of assuming there's going to be this nice little text snippet here somewhere. But what actually happens is sometimes, yeah, we get a few lines of text, but sometimes the data that's sent to us is like this four million word thing. And if we're not careful, our text box is suddenly going like, to get huge and just cover up the whole map and whatnot. So just 
you have to be mindful of um, some CSS properties like, you know, restrict the height and make the user scroll through the box if it's going to be really big. Um, otherwise, it can kind of ruin the layout of a map. Um, and certainly, I'm sure there are plenty of other ways to account for things like that, like, you know, cutting off the text and having a, like, read more button or pages or something like that. Something to be aware of anyway. A uh, quick thing here, I found this example off of one of our projects too, but uh, abbreviation for, I'm talking more now about like label size things. Um, here are the labels on the bottom of this bar chart kind of get restricted in size, and this is just due to some constraints of our layout. Um, so we kind of abbreviate, truncate them with an ellipses, and when you mouse over it, you can get the full name. But uh, I just wanted to point out how you, that you can be more you know, uh, thoughtful about how you abbreviate words. You know, here are the names, we just kind of cut them off at the end, but this is a congressional district, and if we abbreviated every congressional district the same way that we did these names, they'd all say the same thing. They'd just be like C-O-N dot dot dot. And so remembering, in this case, that the number of the district is actually something that you need to see, we abbreviate it a different way. We cut off the word and then show the number. Um, so this, and this is an interactive thing, by the way. You would, the chart doesn't always look like this. You could have like five congressional districts in there, or you could have just like one bar where the thing actually does fit. Um, so we needed to be able to account for all of that. Uh, another thing that always gets me is remembering to format for singular words. Like we have these labels all the time where it's like X number of whatevers, and then you forget that if it's only one, the word is gonna look different. Um, also over here, orders of magnitude, this label, you know, you don't want something that says a thousand thousand. You want that to say one million. So you need to uh, be smart about formatting things like that. Um, and by the way, I guess I don't mention it explicitly, but if you're a D3 user, you know that the axis uh, thing there and the scale ticks are really amazing because they give you these nice pretty numbers out of any range. But they're not really going to label them like that for you. Um, that's just a little like, you know, simple code for how you might do that. I do this quite a lot. Say, add, add an S if it's one. If not, don't add anything. Okay, so a quick couple things about text there. And then um, kind of stepping back to the map as a whole, this term, the lorem ipsum map, which I'll uh, reference in a second, but I'm thinking about how the the whole gist of this is that when we're designing, building a map, we don't have real data. We don't necessarily even have realistic data. So we're using some kind of stand-in, whether it's something we made up or something that's close to what we need or, or what. And we're building our, our whole thing around that. And that can be a problem sometimes. There's this little um, usability study by Rob Roth and Mark Harrower that uh, kind of cautioned against really designing all your interface without also designing your map and knowing what it's going to look like because the user experience can kind of be degraded. So this, this little study was based around this map, which we did um, back in grad school at the University of Wisconsin. Um, also, go Badgers tonight. <laughs> um, we, so we ended up, this, the map itself is kind of this like soft, fuzzy, green, blue thing. <coughs> But we didn't really have that design finalized really while well, we went to town building this interface. So we just started building this like cold, metallic looking UI because when you did things in Flash in 2007, that's what you did. <laughs> and um, so there's a, I mean, there ended up, they did this little user study afterwards, a usability study. And uh, there was some negative reaction to that. It's just the, how incongruous this, this map and the UI were. So that's one of those shruggy moments. I don't have like an answer for how you do that if you don't actually have the material for your map, but it's something to keep in mind. Uh, that said, if you're making fake data just to test your stuff out and to build your UI around it, it actually could be a really good test of code because this is a super unrealistic election map in Egypt that we're kind of in progress on. But if, if your map can work like functionally, um, technically, if it can work with this 
terrible data, then it can probably work with real data. So in some senses, the, uh, the worse your fake data, the better. So this thing, like, you have precincts that are like these stupid multi-polygons and stuff like that, and the map is okay, so we're good. Uh, Carolyn Fish was, was kind enough to get a, a thing posted this morning so I could link to it on, in here, but um, if you go to this, you, you should read her post. It's, she's talking about an experience um, that she had where she was using open data, open street maps specifically, while designing some map templates uh, to stand in for what in the end was going to be like the total opposite of that classified defense data that she could never even see. And there's uh, some obviously some challenges around that, like getting this one type of data to stand in for another type of data when you're designing it. And you know a little bit about what it's going to look like, but you don't know everything. Um, I, I liked her term, trying to come up with smart dummy data. Um, so you can look at her post. It also talks about getting into OpenStreetMap. And um, so starting to wind down here, this is all kind of getting at trying to approach that more traditional human-driven design where you're really paying attention to details, but doing it somehow by rules and code. Uh, I have a quote here from something from Daniel Huffman, a cartographer who uh, I love for, among other reasons, because he's a real rise of the machines alarmist in cartography. Like he might be a time traveler from some cartopocalyptic future. But. <laughs> So I want to do a little, just a sort of thought ex experiment here. This, this is a map that was around the internet so a couple years ago. This wall map, a uh, reference map of the U.S. by David Imus, is like heralded as the greatest paper map ever. And it's, it's a really, it's a good example, of a modern example of that really human, human design map. Like, yeah, it's made on a computer, but. So just to kind of extrapolate this a little bit, because these days we're talking about these tiled web maps of the whole world. Apparently this map, it's one to four million scale and uh, was apparently about 6,000 hours of work. So if we take that out, it's about zoom level seven for six hours. Have that down to zero, double it up to say 18. Um, that's being conservative because map size actually quadruples if you zoom in one, one level. So this map's gonna take him 2,800 years <laughs> to design with that level of care in 222 days. And that's only the US. So this is just a point to what I wanna call big design. This um, challenge of making good design of data that is just far too massive for you to really inspect as a really caring human. That's the question there. And pretty specifically, I'm talking about designing these global maps. Um, and we're usually using OpenStreetMap, unless you're Google or somebody. But this is OpenViz, so we're talking about OpenStreetMap. And this is a data set that's got millions of users, and you just you can't guarantee, there are conventions, but you can't guarantee that the quality and consistency of this data is going to be the same everywhere across the world and that your design is going to work on every little bit of this data. So your challenge, though, is to come up with these rules that it are going to work even though you could never see it all. So I just want to summarize uh, something from uh, Nikki of Mapbox at NASIS last year. She talked uh, a bit about this, well, quite a lot about this, actually, because they do this kind of work, of course. Um, just some rules she, she suggested, prioritize, prioritize your use case, areas in your specific use case, of course, and prioritize the most common examples of something. But then, you know, do go out and look for some atypical examples and try to develop your compromises off of that. Uh, and their software, Mapbox Studio, now has this kind of feature here where you can view multiple areas at once. You can kind of inspect what a uh, certain feature might look like in different areas of the world. I don't, are, we have Mapbox people here because I don't, I can't quite figure out how to use this and I could <laughs> use some help. But um, that's an example of some tools that can help with that. Um, also some of the OpenStreetMap um, APIs and so forth um, where you can kind of inspect details about types of features and tags and geographic distribution and actually get the data and all this stuff. This is an example of some highway tag that as you can see, it gets used a lot in Europe, but not so much in the US. And you could easily be fooled into thinking that this tag just doesn't matter, don't design for it, if you're doing a map of the US. But you don't want to do that if you're doing the whole world. You need to be aware of such issues, and you can explore them through something like this. And of course, with OpenStreetMap, and I'm glossing over OpenStreetMap here, I hope most people know what it is. But if you don't, maybe you don't if you're not a mapper, but it is this just massive uh, open, community-driven uh, geographic data set. So 
if you find something wrong in the course of your inspections that you are doing of your design, you can just go in and fix it, and it's fixed. Um, so if you're a mapper, definitely get into OpenStreetMap. Use the data, first of all, but contribute to the data. Um, there's a whole community out there, which I am not as into as I should be, but it's there. Um, so I think uh, on that mini plug for something super open, I'll, I'll leave it there. But um, thanks. I look forward to...